In the United States, the median price for an orphan drug is about $100,000 per year, 20 times the price of the median non-orphan drug. By 2020, orphan drugs are expected to cost the world $178 billion a year, roughly one-fifth of global prescription drug spending. All that money has led to what the Wall Street Journal calls, and I'm quoting, a deal-making surge among pharmaceutical companies which have been particularly keen on makers of drugs for rare diseases. Given the staggering costs of orphan drugs, you'd think we'd have a solid handle on whether that money is well spent. But the truth is that we don't. Friend of the show, Nick Bagley, a professor of law at the University of Michigan, wrote a series for our blog on orphan drugs, and it was so good, we're bringing it to you here. For the next four weeks, orphan drugs are the topic of healthcare triage. Let's backtrack for a second here. What is an orphan drug? Typically, a new drug in the United States receives 20 years of patent protection, starting when a patent is filed on the drug. But a drug manufacturer can't sell the drug until the FDA approves it based on clinical trials that take many years to conduct. Because patents are usually filed before that testing occurs, the wait for FDA approval cuts into the brand name drug's period of patent monopoly. To make as much money as possible during that shortened period, a drug manufacturer will, all else being equal, prefer to develop drugs for lots and lots of patients. But the market for drugs to treat low prevalence diseases is necessarily small. They're orphan diseases, easily forgotten and often overlooked. In the United States, orphan diseases are defined to affect fewer than 200,000 people, implying a prevalence of about one in 1,620. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, Congress came to believe that the patent system wasn't spurring enough research into drugs for orphan diseases. It therefore adopted the Orphan Drug Act of 1983, which, among other things, confers a seven-year period of market exclusivity on orphan drugs. Significantly, that period runs from the moment the drug is approved for sale, regardless of any remaining patent protection. In other words, drug manufacturers receive a special extended monopoly on orphan drugs that they do not receive for non-orphan drugs. In 2000, the EU adopted similar legislation granting a 10-year exclusivity period to orphan drugs. Other countries have also followed suit. Has the Orphan Drug Act worked? It depends on what you mean by worked. From one perspective, it's worked extravagantly well. Since the advent of the legislation, orphan drugs have been approved in the United States in ever-growing numbers. Indeed, the pace of approvals has accelerated sharply even over the last five years. Between 2011 and 2015, 72 new orphan drugs were launched, almost twice as many as in the five years before. Some of these drugs are genuine breakthroughs. Kaleidico, for example, offers life-changing relief for those suffering from certain subtypes of cystic fibrosis. And Cerezyme treats a variant of Gaucher's disease, a debilitating condition that occurs when an enzyme responsible for fat metabolism doesn't work properly. But these drugs come with an especially hefty price tag. Kaleidico costs more than $300,000 a year. Cerezyme, more than $200,000 a year. Patients will be on both of those for the rest of their lives. And because both were approved as orphan drugs, their manufacturers have seven years to market them without any risk of generic competition. So this makes us question whether the Orphan Drug Act is worth it. In general, the growing number of orphan drugs is taken to mean that orphan drug legislation remains a critical part of the drug development process. The assumption is natural. After all, we all know that the patent system will yield too few orphan drugs because of the restricted market for these drugs, right? That's the premise behind the adoption of the Orphan Drug Act, and it's one that holds sway still today. Notice, though, the premise is flawed. What drives drug manufacturers is the total amount of money they anticipate earning on a given drug. Total revenues, in turn, are the product of the price of the drug and the number of units sold. For orphan drugs, manufacturers won't be able to move that many units. But what if they can charge up the wazoo for the units they do sell? Due to a combination of market forces and legal obstacles, payers, both public and private, find it nearly impossible to resist paying for the efficacious drugs, however much they cost. The inelasticity of the market gives manufacturers extraordinary pricing power during periods of monopoly protection. That pricing power helps explain why the median price of an orphan drug is a jaw-dropping $100,000 per year.
For a market of 50,000 patients, well under the $200,000 cap for orphan designation, total revenue for a median price drug would be $5 billion a year. Yes, you heard that right. That's billion with a B. Not all orphan drugs will have a market of that size, nor will all orphan drugs command a $100,000 price tag, but lots of them will, and lots of them do. For those drugs, a brief period of market exclusivity would be more than enough to cover the cost of drug development, even under dubious and inflated estimates of those costs. Seven years of market exclusivity is just gilding the lily. Given the potential upside, it's hard to argue we'd have no orphan drugs without the Orphan Drug Act. We might not have as many as we do today. As Aaron Kesselheim concluded in a 2011 review, and I'm quoting, the most methodologically rigorous studies of the Orphan Drug Act indicate that there was a response to its incentives. But we'd still have some, as Kesselheim also notes, quoting again, other market forces, such as anticipated revenue, may also have affected orphan drug development. To measure the effects of the Orphan Drug Act, you'd want to know how many orphan drugs would have been developed in its absence. Once you figured that out, and we aren't close to doing that, you'd need to weigh the benefits of them against the costs. And we'll be doing that next week here at Healthcare Triage. Healthcare Triage is supported in part by viewers like you through Patreon.com a service that allows you to support the show through a monthly donation. Your support makes this show bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Jonathan Dunn, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam. Thanks, Joe, Jonathan, and Sam. More information can be found at patreon.com slash healthcare triage.